All right. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome in across the pond. We've got folks joining us across North America and, of course, our speakers joining us in Ireland today. My name is Jesse. I'm with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to us, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is exciting for two big reasons. Number one, this is February. So this is our entire month solely dedicated to the most amazing women in science, exploration, and conservation on planet Earth. We've kicked out all the dudes. We've got like 55 programs. It's absolutely insane. It's been a ton of fun. Check out absolutely everything on our YouTube channel. All the more to come. They're going to be there in three weeks. They're going to be there in three years. There's lots to explore and discover. Now today too, and a special shout out to our health environmental leaders who just joined us live in the background too. So welcome in on StreamYard guys. Um, we are continuing with our Wild Hope series. So Wild Hope is something that I have wanted to work with for ages. And in the summer, I had the chance to talk with them about setting up a really exciting series featuring their stories of hopeful conservation efforts. Conservation can seem pretty daunting at times. There's a lot of threats facing wildlife and habitats around the globe. But there are millions of people doing really tangible, incredible things to bring back wildlife, to bring back those habitats, and they're making a real impact. So Wild Hope is an incredible series that showcases some of these incredible stories you can check it out at wildhope.tv and on YouTube. Specifically, this link, which is a little unwieldy, is our link for our topic du jour. But if you look up Gardener to Guardian, you can find it there uh, as well. I'll make sure we all have a link for that at the end of the broadcast. Now, we featured Callie Broadus not too long ago talking about her work in Ecuador. Does nature have rights? It was an incredible program. It's on our YouTube channel. But today, we're bringing in Mary Reynolds, who has an incredible project, as we mentioned, turning... Uh, becoming from a gardener to a guardian. So we're gonna bring her on to say a quick hello, feature a little bit of a showcase of that Wild Hope episode, and then talk to her about her amazing work with We Are The Ark. So Mary, welcome to the program today. So nice to have you on. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jesse. Hello everyone, how are you? Um, oh, we are so good. We've got, as I said, like groups in Nova Scotia, Maryland, Ontario, Virginia, and beyond. I'm in Newfoundland, so it's freezing cold here where I am. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit chillier than where you get to be. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to just say hi and then showcase a little bit about this work with our clip before we dive in with your presentation today. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Thanks, Jesse. Amazing. Well, let's bring that up and take us away. I think gardens are part of an old world and I think we need to build a new one. So I set up a movement called We Are The Art. And it's something that everybody who has any land or even a windowsill can do. So to build an ark, take half of your land and give it back to nature and restore a nature plant community. Just take your time and watch and get to know the land. What I say initially is don't do anything. It's going to start getting less tidy. This still doesn't work. So we ask people to put up a sign and say this is an ark and it takes away the shame of not having what society has told you you should have. You have to remove non-native plants, specifically non-native invasive plants. Those plants are not part of the local food web. The joy in creating an ark comes from all the creatures that return and you end up your heart opens to include every single one of them and they become part of your family and you become part of their family and there's a trust and a, and a magic that happens. Mary, you are so joyous in this. Like you talk about the magic, you talk about the joy, and it's a really exciting thing because it's something that anybody can do. Like we, again, we talked with Callie a few weeks ago and she's incredible doing amazing work to save our huge plot of rainforest in Ecuador. We've got some other great stories coming that are very local in the next few months. But with We Are The Ark, you can do this anywhere on planet earth, which makes it such a special project. Yeah. Um, so I'm so curious, uh, I mean, we can dive in with the presentation too. I know you've got a lot of great imagery to show us, but like, how did this get started? And uh, what was the, was there a first arc? Was it something in your own backyard? Like, tell us a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, so um, I started it when I was looking out my window one day, I was working all over the world as a garden designer. And um, it was, you know, I thought I was doing good work, you know, because, because people feel like gardens are somehow natural but actually that 
I've realized that gardens are not natural anymore, you know, um, but that they're, they're most people's experience of nature. But when I was um, looking out my window, I saw a fox run past um, in the lawn down below in my garden. And a, a hare was chasing him, which was unusual. <laughs> and, um, I kept watching and watching to see where they, whether they would come back out of the wild place they ran into. Um, and I saw a little hedgehog run along the ditch. Um, now these are all native creatures to Ireland and um, they should have been hibernating and they certainly wouldn't generally be out during the day. Um, they come out at night because they're afraid of humans, you know. And so I went outside. It reminded me of those stories of, of, of Noah's Ark when I was a kid. And so I went out to see what they were running away from. And I walked down the end of my country lane in Ireland. And on the other side of this very quiet road, there had been this really um, impenetrable thicket of a field, a native plant community, kind of an emerging woodland. So it was full of thorny plants. It was You couldn't get into it. Like it was all thorny trees and shrubs and um, all sorts of wild herbs and um, emergent woodland. And uh, somebody had got planning permission to build a house at the top of the field and they'd gone in with a digger and they'd cleared it out instantly without any thought for all the creatures that had called it home. And I realized I'd done this myself so many times creating gardens and that we have forgotten that actually this planet is a shared planet and the wildlife are really struggling for places to go. Yep. You know? This is something that we come to in a lot of our conservation broadcasts and students will often ask, like, what's the biggest threat facing wildlife? And climate change is something that goes to a lot of people's minds now because everyone talks about it in school, but habitat loss is probably the biggest one worldwide. And it really doesn't matter what species we're talking about. If you don't have a home to live in, whether you're a bird or a whale or what have you, uh, it leads to population decline. It leads to the loss of these species. Um, so uh, with this in mind, I'd love if you'd bring up some imagery highlighting some of the stuff you've done with We Are The Ark. Um, and again, I'm gonna be sharing all of this with classes after the fact as well. But it's been really heartening for me to see that there's been so much work done. We're going to talk about the specific project today, but bringing back pollinator gardens is a huge thing in Canada now. Planting tiny forests on school grounds has become a huge thing. So it's exciting to see this groundswell of support for this idea of just leaving a little bit aside for nature. So with that in mind, uh, take us away. Let's bring this up and uh, show some fun stuff together. Hey, thank you. Um, can you see me now? We can see. Uh, yep. You go full screen with that and we're golden. Okay, so when I returned to my kitchen after that um, event of that day, I decided to base it on the story of the Ark, but I didn't want it to be any way religious in any shape or form. So I called it, We, we Are the Ark. Um, and I, I thought of an idea of asking people to put up a sign saying this is an Ark instead of a garden. And the Ark stands for Acts of Restorative Kindness to the Earth. And it allows people to um, to give as much of any land they have under their care back because basically we can't wait for anybody else to step up to um, fix the you know the collapse of nature which is happening rapidly all around us. Um, it's really up to all of us, and you know if anybody has any land under their care, it may seem like a small thing to to save their patch of the planet, but. The idea is to create a patchwork quilt of hope, you know, because this would be um, a typical example of what Ireland looks like from above. Um, and Ireland, um, like many places in the world, it, it, it looks lovely and green, but it's actually devoid of wildlife. Practically nature has collapsed here already um, because of industrial farming and forestry, industrial fishing um, and gardening, um, gardening which is, you know, people think is, you know, something natural, but really it's not. It's, you know, this this would be our typical woodland in Ireland. This is not a native forest, it's a crop. Um, a lot of our landscapes are like this. Um, they're kept mown because we equate tidiness with care in the landscape. And um, that's where we've been going wrong. We've been pushing nature further and further away. And the web of life is this incredible network of, all the creatures on the planet, every single one of them having a really important role to play, except for humans, um, because if humans weren't here, the web of life would be absolutely fine without us. But each thread in that web or each thread in that tapestry of life, they're all dependent upon each other. 
But the important thing is that we are completely dependent upon them in order for us to have clean air, clean water, food, shelter, a working ecosystem. Um, so really the only possible role for humans to play on this planet is one of guardian, caretaker of all the other creatures that give us life, you know. So the interesting thing, and a lot of you children probably will, will be part of this syndrome, which is called shifting baseline syndrome, which is that um, each passing generation has um, a different idea of what is natural anymore. So you might think that your local parks are natural or that your gardens are natural, but generally this would be, this image here is an example of what people see Ireland as being natural. But this Ireland used to be 80% covered in oak woodland and we only have 0.01% of that left. Um, it's mostly like a sheep ranch now really, um, which is very, very depressing and very sad. And the good thing about it is that having built arcs all over the world with people, um, helping them do this, um, it it really um, is very inspiring because um, it's a very simple thing. It's about restoring native plant communities in different layers, as many layers as possible. And um, it's about removing non-native invasive species because they're not part of the local food web and they come in, they're brought in as part of a gardening kind of fashion. And then we have to remove them because Generally, they do too well here and they grow um, too quickly and they take over and they block out the light and they don't allow native species to have a chance. And then without the native plants, um, native plants have evolved alongside the native insects. And so the native insects need the native plants for their food. And without their food, the insects collapse. And without the insects, everything else collapses. So the the, the um, an, an, a, an intact soil and an intact native plant community is where wildlife find food and shelter. Um, and so we have a lot of um, a lot of questions to answer, like why do we do this? Like why do we do this um, when we could restore it into something incredibly vibrant and beautiful? And that's what happens when people build arcs: is that they they actually create something which gives them hope because they see how quickly nature can recover. And it's so exciting because like, for example, in my own arc here, um, this is an example of an arc lawn, for example, it doesn't have to be, now this is, this is a native plant to Ireland, but it may well be an invasive plant in your part of the country because this is very, your part of the world, but every part of the world has their own native plants. Um, and here, this is an example of, of a self-willed native meadow, which is not what we are led to believe is what, you know, people think they're helping by planting non-native meadows or non-native pollinator plants. And that's not helpful because um, it may, it's really a garden center supporting narrative as opposed to um, a nature supporting narrative. So native, native, native as diverse a native plant community as you can is is going to pull all this life into your world which is just going to be so exciting that's an example of a, a wildflower meadow which is all about color and fashion and this is a more natural one which is the seed bank has emerged um because the land knows what plants need to heal it and generally in a in if you have an intact seed bank which is full of native seeds that's what is necessary and then you build up layers of shrubs and trees and dead wood and water and everything you can think of to support um, nature. So I, I'm going to stop there. Well, very, very quickly, I'll tell you that just for example, in my own piece of land, um, it was an industrially farmed six acres and um, my my parents died and they left me this piece of land and I, grow, I built a house on it and I started to build an ark and almost instantly, from being a kind of a dead piece of land, um, which has no value to wildlife. It's almost like the the creatures know that you're offering them sanctuary. They can feel it because um, animals and plants, they can they, they communicate through their heart. So you can feel it in your own heart. And they, they arrived almost overnight. Um, so from having nothing here, it's now hopping with life. I have so many of these tiny little shrews, which are like mice with long noses. They're tiny and they're absolutely the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. And we have badgers and we have foxes and we have herons. Um, I have owls. Um, 
I have the most incredible array of insects. Um, and I have um, actually, I think it was the Wild Hope people that were here that um, they discovered I had all sorts of really interesting water creatures, which I didn't know I had, like um, things called leeches, which are just amazing. Um, I didn't even know we had them in Ireland, let alone on my own land. Mm -hmm. They just came up overnight, you know, and and it's just, it may not seem like a big deal to have a patch of um, restored land, but it's incredibly important because there's more and more research that shows that nature needs places where she can rest and recover from the onslaught of um, non-native plants and chemicals that we have poured upon her. Um, and she needs places where she can rest and recover. And then when we eventually do understand that the, the most important work left that will pull the whole world together, the, the, the whole world can be pulled together by realizing that the most important work left to us is to restore this planet back to its full abundance and health. And if we all get behind that, it'll really pull everybody together. You know, it's a really, really exciting time to be alive. And even if you've only got a small window box, um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that even those stepping stones on windowsills are really important for insects and birds to move and survive and creating little places where they can survive and, and rest and feed and get a drink, and um, all very important. And these patches, that's where nature can recover from, those, recover, those restored native plant ecosystems. That's where we can, we can spread the health from. So every little patch that can be given back is going to be really important. So the more of it we can do, the better. So let's say let, um, I'm going to escape this now and we'll do some questions because um, otherwise I'll ramble on forever. <laughs> hey, if anyone has reason to ramble on forever, it's you. That was a beautiful story. And thank you so, so much, Mary. I, you actually covered one of my first questions, which is how long does it take to see the benefit? And this is something that, again, we see at a lot of different scales. I'm going to be sharing with our classes some stories about uh, the Nepa state in England, which is a really cool story, Cabo Pulmo in Mexico. Like when we give wildlife that space, it's quite incredible how fast it comes back. Um, so anecdotally or from the other arcs that you've worked with, like how, how quickly do people see wildlife start coming back in your experience? I'm really curious. But very, very quickly. Um, like People see things um, t returning into their spaces literally overnight sometimes or, you know, within a few weeks as things start to get messier because there's very little life in a tidy space. And we have been kind of indoctrinated into believing that tidiness equates with care. And so we have created these very unnatural spaces called gardens, which are filled with, you know, plants which are like soldiers. But plants have communities they have layers and they, they, there's like the, there's the herb layer there's there's the underground layer there's um you know the perennial layer the shrub layer the the, the the woodland layer and then all the life lies in the edges between those layers they're called ecotones and um so the edges are where you would be trying to create as many edges as possible so you might have you might mow a path through a meadow you know, and that's an edge between the short grass and herbs and the taller, wilder herbs. And then you'd have an edge between maybe a pond and a meadow or a pond and a shrub, shrubby area, scrubby area. Um, and so the, the more of these kind of areas that people try and create, the more life that turns, that seems to come back, you know. And the other thing that people do is create um, connections and, you know, particularly over in Europe, and it's not so much over there, but people have really strong boundaries between their spaces, you know, so they have walls or fences and wildlife can't travel across, you know. So people cut holes in their boundaries and they replace their boundaries with living hedges. And very, very quickly, they start to see all sorts of amazing creatures sharing the land with them. Such a nice story. And it's something that, again, we see reflected at all scales. We featured Yellowstone to Yukon, which is the largest nature connection corridor in the world being planned and slowly being created. And it's exciting to see that at a garden scale versus something that is literally crossing an entire continent. It also helps, I must say, like I as a Torontonian, and I know we've got some Ontario classes, we're used to raccoons in our backyards. Like the foxes and hedgehog thing is really delightful. Like I wish, I think you got the better end of the stick there as much as I like raccoons. 
Uh, I love raccoons. They're so they're fun. They're, they're okay. They're, they got their moments. Um, we have to plan our garbage bin separately so that they don't get in because they so want in. Uh, um, but the I only can, reason they want in is because they're hungry and we've taken away all their sources. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I should know who I'm talking to in this story. Uh, but, I'm so glad you talked about this. And I mean, not even just the gardens in our backyard, but I think a lot of us sort of lose sight of is the this preponderance of lawns. And this is not just on a farm scale, but like we grow up and I'm Canadian. I know our American friends feel the same way. Like you go down any cul-de-sac, any street, and there's a big front lawn and a big back lawn. Like I think Kentucky bluegrass is the most prevalent plant in the world. And it covers this huge tract of territory that's basically a dead zone for wildlife. And so when you, again, take the simple action of, leaving it, let it go, see what happens, let those weeds grow, it makes such a tremendous impact. Well, you can't really leave things like that. You actually have to get rid of them because they're too invasive. And I don't think Kentucky bluegrass is native really to a lot of no. places. So that would have to come out if it's not native, you know? And so there is a bit of work involved, but there's a wonderful organization over in um, the States and Canada, I think. I think it's both of them. And it's called Homegrown National Park. And um, if you look it up, you'll see there's a huge kind of movement towards replacing lawns and gardens with with um, native plants. And they have wonderful resources, you know. But um, yeah, so that's really worth tracking down. Very, very cool. I'm going to head to our, our class in a minute, Mr. And Pleasures Group. If you guys want to come in for a question in a minute, we're going to take a bunch from you. YouTubers, you can chime in as well. But I'm really glad you highlighted this fact that we do sometimes need to get rid of the invasive species before we can start. I used to, uh, Toronto has three big ravine systems that you can walk down to explore and they're full of nature. There's raccoons, there's deer, there's all sorts of things. And I went once and they ripped out half the forest. And I was like, I was shocked, but the forest was all invasive plants that didn't belong there. And they had huge signs to say, look, we're removing this, that we can plant back the things that should be here to bring back these native communities. So it was jarring, but it was with that explanation made a lot of sense. And it's exciting to see it sort of start to, to regrow. Mary, I don't want to keep talking. I'm talking too much. I'm going to head us over to our, our class. London, come on in, guys, and take us away. Hey. Hi, um, my name is Maitland. I'm from the HELP program. I was wondering, how would you go about converting unused cropland into um, an ARC? Ooh. Okay, unused cropland. Well, I don't really know what unused cropland is. Is that like a farm? Is that like a farm? Um, it. I was specifically asking about a property that I have. Um, it used to be used to um, for wheat and whatnot, but now we're trying to naturalize it. And my family wants to plant a bunch of trees, but would it be better to go about planting native grass? What a great question. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. I suppose um, it's, it's very difficult to answer because every patch of land is unique, you know, and so there's not one answer for all pieces of land. But on a general basis, um, because we've removed so many creatures from the web of life, um, such as things like wolves, you know, or, you know, the large herbivore mammals or whatever it is, um, we have to step in and become those creatures in order to maintain a, a healthy ecosystem. And what I mean by that is that we have to carry out the services that they naturally would provide. So it sounds complicated, but on a simple idea that means creating layers of ecosystem, right? So if the large herbivore mammals were there or or the creatures that root through the through the earth in order to get like larvae and things with their noses or whatever it is they they'd be rooting around. Like over here we'd have like we probably wild boar would be one example in Europe that they'd root around in the ground to get larvae and roots and things. Um but what you would do is you would you would try and step in and create like you'd have an area that you'd root up a little bit every year and then you'd have um you'd create like i suppose what i do is i help people design spaces so that they can create as many of these layers as possible so you'd have you'd have your kind of you'd have your short kind of grazed layer which would might be a mown path through a meadow and then you you'd decide how many of those kind of areas will you have? Will you have like a circular kind of grazed area that you and your family might use? And then you might have another path through another part of a, of a, of a scrubby, shrubby area. 
and then so you have to plan it out and decide where will I put my pond because of clean sources of water are so important in order to support wildlife so you would you would kind of make a plan and decide will I put my pond in here um if you're allowed put in ponds and things and, and you know and then will I put my woodland in this area will I will I put more than one patch of, of scrubby shrubby area will I have more than one meadow and you you try and create as many different layers and edges as possible and that sounds complicated but it's not really it's about creating spaces on almost like a garden design but it's like an arc design and it's all done with how can i support as much life as possible there that's long now, <laughs> this is fantastic answer and what i'm going to do too so for uh, you i'm going to look into some options in ontario where you can find it where to get native pollinator plants and things that you can actually put in to help create an ecosystem like this there's some really great biosphere reserve stuff happening uh just a little bit south of you guys uh there so uh, stay tuned and I'll email Ms. Trent Pleasure with some things that you might be able to find out some ways of going about this specifically for you as a student. So very cool question. I like how we, our first question was like on ecosystem level. Way to go. Um, Mary, is there a number of arts? How many of these have been made? Where are they being made around the world? I'm really curious before we come back to our class for our next question. Yeah, we, well, we, I, um, I mean, I, we do have a map on the website, but most people don't like to put their arcs on the map but you can if you want to and it's just i i pin them on myself whenever i have time and um so there's a place on the website that you can add your arc to the map which is really nice but i mean we have a group um on social media and there's like i can't remember how many there is now i think there's like maybe um maybe nearly i think there's nearly thirty thousand people or what we call them archivists instead of gardeners they're archivists and um uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that all of them are part of this movement, you know, but I hear kind of a lot of, I hear, I hear a lot that people see arc signs all over the world. People come back and tell me that they've seen an arc mm. sign in France and they've seen, you know, they see these signs on people's gates and gardens and, and it's, a, it's, it's a movement that's spreading and they have them in different languages and, you know, it's kind of cool. That must be so heartening. It's very exciting. We've got someone from Uruguay joining in the YouTube chat. So maybe they're aware or a art creator themselves, which is wonderful. So uh, thank you for that, Mary. Um, we're going to head back to our environmental leaders again. YouTubers, don't be shy. If you have any questions, please do share. And if you don't have a YouTube account, you can email them to me too over our next few minutes that we're doing Q&A. But London, come on back in. Hey, West Mr. Pons. Hello. Um, Hi. How do you keep invasive species from invading your arc? Ooh. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of different ways of doing that. So what we say to people in, um, if we can avoid using chemicals at all, please do, you know, if there's any way of avoiding them, because chemicals cause more problems than they solve a lot of the time. But there are some invasive plants that they they there doesn't seem to be a way around it, um, but to kind of inject them with these noxious, horrible things, you know. But, but I find if you take your time and you dig things out if you can. As to certain plants, you're not supposed to dig them out because even a tiny bit of the root will spread. So it depends on the invasive plant, you know. But um, there's lots of different ways of doing it. You can cover the whole area. You can, you can cover the whole area with heavy, dark plastic, um, you know, um, um, for a certain amount of time that tends to kill off a lot of stuff. And then when you're left with bare soil the year later, you can replant with native species. Um, you can um, cover everything with cardboard if you can, if they're invasive and you have to be very careful, you have to investigate which plant you're dealing with and what is the recommended way of dealing with it locally. And you will find that information generally online because some of them you can dig out. Some of them you have to make sure that they don't set seed because they like, over here, there's, there's one called Rhododendron ponticum, which is like a native to China. And it, it, it completely takes over our hillsides here. Um, and people thought it was so pretty, they didn't think much of it, but it poisons um, bees that go to collect um, nectar from it. And it also takes over and lets nothing else ever survive. And it just wipes out the entire ecosystem. And, and it, each plant creates millions of seeds, you know? Um, 
So there's loads of answers to that. Again, that's a huge question. Invasive yeah. species management is a massive and specific to each site and specific yeah. to each plant. So this is really important just to do a little bit of research before you go about doing this. Now, if you have a garden and you've got one plant and you want to rip it up, again, take a look and see if you might be causing some unintended harm in doing that. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges in all of biodiversity conservation in the world is managing invasive species. And again, whether it's plants, whether it's invasive fish, this is something that we're increasingly bringing species to places that they aren't from and they can take over and it can be a hugely detrimental thing, both the people and the ecosystem. So Take that time, do that research. Again, I'll try and find some stuff for our Ontario class if you guys want to check that out when you're done. Um, so stay tuned for an email at the end of the broadcast. Mary, is there a best way to get started? You've talked about as simple as a window bin. Uh, some of these students will have literal backyards. Uh, the school obviously has school grounds. Have you had schools come in and create an arc? And is there a way to get started that you find is best? I know this is a big general question as well, but I'm curious if you have an answer. Well, I, I spent a long time working out these answers and they're on the website. It's like how to build an ark for a school, how to build an ark at home, um, there's, or how to build a public ark. And, but generally, it it's, it's comes back to the same answer. It, it's like you give as much of your land back as you can. And even if it's like keeping your garden almost exactly the same as it is, if you can just take, take note of, of the plants that you have in there and see if they're actually you know is there nests in there like if you took it out is it going to remove someone's home or if it's not doing anything if it's just there because we've decided it's pretty then you should take it out um, and replace it with a native plant and not just one native plant like try and put layers of plants in so that there's messiness in there and you can still create kind of you know, edgings and kind of shapes um, around the edges so that people don't feel like it's a mess because it's hard for people to change this kind of indoctrination that everything has to be perfect because um, especially for older people like me um, and my generation and the ones beyond me, they're, they find it very, very hard. They get ashamed. They get shamed by their neighbours if their place does not look the way they're told it should, you know. Um, but generally it's about um, native plant community restoration and creating as many edges and ecotones as possible, putting in dead wood, piles of dead wood, um, putting in um, like wildlife supports, like piles of dry stones. Um, again, if there's like a fire hazard area, you might not be allowed to put in piles of dead wood. Um, <laughs> So certain things, certain places of the world, like Ireland, where everything is always raining, that's not a problem. But I think you might have a problem with it over there. I'm so glad you mentioned dead things, though, because this is something that a lot of people overlook. So uh, one thing that's become a big thing in Canada that I've seen a lot of places is leaving your dead leaves in your backyard. We rake our leaves. We used to put them in bags. You put them out. The garbage truck comes by and takes them. And if you leave a few leaves, you leave habitat for things to lay eggs or build nests, whether that's insects, birds, things like shrews. That goes a long way. And in forests, we're so constantly clearing out dead things. Uh, fire management's been a huge thing in Parks Canada and the United States as well, where we clear out all the dead things and you leave no homes for wildlife. And when fires do happen, they end up a lot worse because of our trying to overmanage these habitats that, again, quite literally the balance of nature have managed themselves quite well for, you know, millennia, millions of years. So I'm, I'm really glad we touched upon that. Thank you, Barry. Um, we could talk all day about this. Time flies when you're having fun. So we are nearing the end of the broadcast. I'm just curious, uh, as someone who's so hopeful and optimistic, how you are that way. So given your experience, you've had the chance to be involved in a lot of really amazing stuff. And again, hope and conservation can be in short supply, but I think it's so reasonable to have it. And there's so many great stories being told in Wild Hope, um, of which you're a, a exemplar how do you keep up this optimism tell us more <laughs> well i don't always you know <laughs> it depends on the day you know but i do get hopeful when i'm out in in my arc or when i'm helping other people build arcs i see um how quickly nature can recover and that's where the hope lies um because if you're sitting back and waiting for politicians to fix the mess we've created it's very easy to get very down about it, you know, but if you just take your patch of the planet 
and you fix that bit and then your neighbor does the same and you know there's 40 million acres of lawn in the united states i don't know how much is in canada but that's a lot of restored land that would be a massive help to wildlife if that was restored you know um it's the most irrigated crop over there as well like that's crazy like nobody needs these things you know but um i think that's how i stay hopeful is by seeing how quickly nature can recover but the saying that um the old growth woodlands are the most important thing it takes thousands and thousands of years for an, a real a really truly diverse woodland to um develop and they are the last bastions of diversity, the last bastions of hope. They're, they really are our only hope because that's where the true seeds of um, recovery will come from. And so all our arcs will hopefully join up at some point, you know, and we'll have to start looking at roads and all the, the ways we've cut up um, nature's habitat, you know, and how we can create bridges and tunnels to connect everything back up together again um because they they're the most important thing hmm. and that's what happens is that you realize it's not about us it's about them and by restoring as much of it as you can it, it has a massive impact you know and so that's how i get hopeful because you see how quickly we can do this and if enough of us jump on board this ship <laughs> We'll be able to do so much so quickly, and that's what's exciting about it. I'm going to be sharing all sorts of great examples of this at every scale for our classes when we've done this broadcast. But you're uh, talking about old growth forest reminded me of one of my favorite things I've ever seen in a recent conservation area. So about 40 minutes north of Toronto, near my aunt's house, we went out in this beautiful walk in this planted forest, and it said the big plaque at the beginning was future old growth forest. Like they take in farmland, just like our student, and they planted a forest of native forest trees. And they're like, you know, in like a thousand, two thousand years, this will be an old growth forest. And it'll have that layered ecosystem. It'll have those edges. It'll have that wildlife brought back because of this hopeful action taken now. And so all our students, uh, wherever you're joining from around the world, you can do these sorts of things now. And it can lead to tangible impacts, not just immediately, as we've talked about throughout this broadcast, but in centuries and millennia to come, which is very exciting, Mary. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. This is so much fun. Again, this is our second of our 10-part Wild Hope series. I really encourage everyone to check out wildhope.tv. So many incredible stories. We are the arc.org. I'm going to be sharing a bazillion more things in this long email, as well as some surveys, which if you're willing to fill out, that would be marvelous. Uh, Mary, I'm going to bring in our class uh, live. YouTubers, you can yell out at home too, but thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you guys all very